On today's show, the schedule is now out for the Atlanta Hawks for the upcoming regular season. We'll get into all of that. And part two with myself and Andrew Kelly of Peachtree Hoops from yesterday. We'll have all of that and more coming up. You are Locked On Hawks, your daily Atlanta Hawks podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello, friends. Welcome to episode 1538 of the Lockdown Hawks podcast. I am your host, Brad Roland, coming to you on a Thursday evening into Friday here in mid August. And today's show is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the Lockdown Podcast Network. Visit fanduel.com slash lockdown right now to get started. And I should tell you the top of the podcast to make us your first listen each and every day. Please subscribe to the podcast anywhere you get your podcast, places like Apple and Spotify and YouTube on the video side. And if you missed it, I talked to Andrew Kelly of Peachtree Hoops yesterday and sort of a part one of two. Part two is coming in a moment in this same podcast. But with all that said, the regular season schedule is out, so we'll have to leave with that at the top of the show today. No huge surprises. It is what it is. Like We kind of know what the schedule is going to look like on some level, but the order, the wrinkles are always interesting to kind of go into now. I'm not going to go into an hour-long deep dive, but you know, want to lay out kind of the interesting points of the schedule as we know them at this point in time. As a reminder, the final game of the preseason is actually going to be October 20th, and from there, things begin to heat up. The Hawks' season opener is Wednesday, October 25th, against the Hornets. That's a road game, actually, up in Charlotte. And then the home opener is two days later, Friday, October 27th, against the New York Knicks in a game that should be a lot of fun. Obviously, there's a little bit of history with those two teams. Lots of Knicks fans, I'm sure, will be trying to get in the building for that one. Trey Young, Jalen Brunson, two good teams, and that should be a lot of fun there. Um, From there, the in-season tournament, Sort of group play has been set now for November. The Hawks, as a reminder, are in a group with Detroit and Philadelphia, Indiana and Cleveland. They'll play the Pistons and Cavs on the road and the Sixers and Pacers at home. We'll talk about that much more when we get to it. One note, though, on that. If the Hawks were to make it to the in-season tournament semifinals and finals, which which actually happened in Vegas in early December, they would have a heck of a schedule. If that were to happen again, that's a big if only four teams qualify. So I won't bank on that. But the Hawks actually finished that pre run with five straight road games, Washington, Boston, Cleveland, San Antonio and then Milwaukee. And then if they were to go to Vegas from there, that'd be seven straight games away from home. And then after that, they would play Denver at home on the 11th of December and then three straight road games after that. So if they were again, if they were to make it to Las Vegas, they would be playing essentially 10 out of 11 games on the road, including, uh, you know, by coastal travel to Vegas, et cetera. So that'd be, uh, I guess, a good problem to have if it were to happen, but it'd be pretty crazy. Um, Anyway, from there, uh, no Christmas, as we talked about on the last podcast that we did on this this feed, but the Hawks are playing on some holidays. They have a 3 o'clock p.m. Eastern time game on New Year's Eve in Washington, D.C. against the Wizards. That's the only sort of other holiday-ish game other than the trademark ML- MLK Day game for the Hawks, which is going to be happening again, fortunately for all people involved. The Hawks will play at home against the San Antonio Spurs and at Victor Womanyama. That'll be a that's kind of the headliner pitch of the Spurs this year. A 3:30 game on MLK Day. It's a TNT game. State Farm should be electric as always. And then we'll fast forward a little bit to the end of the schedule. The, the final game at home is Charlotte on April 10th, and then they have the last two games on the road. The finale of the A2 game season is going to be Indiana on april the 14th some quirks in here that i will at least point out before we get out of here on this particular topic today the hawks actually host 10 games in a single month that's january uh they have a long homestand at the end of that month and they actually at one point play 12 out of 15 games at home in that point of the of of the schedule late in the year though they have a 9 of 11 on the road so obviously it's kind of a normal quirk thing but we're keeping an eye on only one big west coast trip for the hawks this year it's a five gamer in March. There's another five gamer again um, before the instant tournament semifinals, but that's actually all in the Eastern and Central Time Zone. So only one big West Coast trip. There's usually two of those. And what, they, what they did sort of instead is that they carved them up into smaller increments. So for instance, there's a, a pretty weird two game trip to play the Kings and Warriors on the road. You don't usually see a two gamer to the West Coast, but that's going to be happening there. Also, Bob Rathen pointed this out. Nine of Atlanta's 15 Western Conference road games are after March 7th. That's very late. So very backloaded with their travel to the West Coast this year. Speaking of back-to-backs, 15 of those this year, five of them are home-home back-to-backs, which is a little bit more friendly. And the Hawks actually play, uh, actually travel, I should say, 
a little bit less than a typical team, like bottom six or seven in terms of total miles traveled over the course of the season, according to positive residual. There are two series, kind of the baseball style series that they had a couple of last year as well. This year they play a two game set in Toronto. That's actually kind of nice. No customs going back and forth, just, you know, two games up there and then never have to go back there again this year. I'm sure the Hawks probably like that setup. And they actually have a three game trip to New York City, twice against Brooklyn and then the Knicks all in within a six day period of time. That's a pretty easy travel thing as well. Get up there, get settled and stay for almost a week. National TV wise. No huge surprise here, but the Hawks are not on the high level of national TV games. They do have 10 NBA TV games, which I personally don't count. They are sort of in the middle between a regular game and a national TV game, but they have 10 of those. They have three SBN games and two TNT games. The 15 number, as far as as national TV games, is pretty much right in the middle, but the five non-NBA TV games that are national is pretty much near the bottom. There are probably six, seven teams below the Hawks, but not a ton of national TV games, which I know Hawks fans always don't like, but there you go. Uh, this is what we knew already. The Hawks will be going, as a reminder, to Mexico City against the Orlando Magic on November 9th. That's an NBA TV game as well. Um, only one real like you know, player-driven game to point out right now anyway, and that is that John Collins will make his return to Atlanta on February 27th with the Jazz. Uh, usually there are at least more guys that like kind of lead the team, but right now he's the only one that's kind of a prominence coming back to play against Atlanta in his uh, for the first time in his old, sort of his old stopping ground back in Atlanta. Also noteworthy here, the Hawks play every team in the East four times except for Milwaukee, Philadelphia, New York, Chicago, Brooklyn, and Detroit. That's pretty favorable because Milwaukee, Philly, and New York are projected to be three of the top six or seven teams in the East. So to, to sort of miss all of them at least once extra is probably pretty good. They got, they got to play Boston four times, Miami four times, but still that's a small positive, I would say. And I mentioned this before, the last thing here, a site called Positive Residual does a great roundup um, pretty much in real time of the schedule stuff at a pretty advanced level with some data. And the Hawks have eight rest advantages this year and 11 disadvantages. That's not great. It's not terrible. Um, The Hawks actually, again, have about 39,000 miles of travel. That's well below average, which is a good thing in terms of that. That site also has the Hawks as having one of the six or seven easiest schedules in terms of overall strength right now. I wouldn't worry about that too much. Teams will be, you know, ebbing and flowing as to who's good and injuries and all that stuff. But that's probably not, it's not a bad thing and nothing else. And I encourage you to check that out if you want more depth on all of this stuff. So at some point in the near future, I'll probably go through some games to circle in terms of like just real intrigue, you know, playing the Nuggets or playing the Heat or whatever, uh, some games to circle. But for now, that's kind of the broad overview of things. We'll have more on that probably next week when I am uh, more locked in from this weekend and all that fun stuff. But that's all I have on the schedule for now. 82 games will be played. Circle that now. Oh, one more final note here. Only 80 games are scheduled because of the in-season tournament. So the Hawks will play two games during that week no matter what. It's just that if you make the finals and it's in my finals, you play in Vegas that, that week. If you don't, the, Haw- the NBA has to kind of rejigger the schedule. So keep that in mind. Only 80 games are scheduled. There'll be two more of those coming. Um, we, we won't know them until like the end of November when the actual in-season tournament comes to a close. Okay. Well, plenty to look at from now. Mark your calendars. I know I've already started to do that with my stuff to circle on the coverage side of things, but hopefully you can get down to San Farm Marina or if you are not living in Atlanta, get to where your closest NBA team might be to check out the Hawks in the near future. But with all of that said, we'll have a break from here from our sponsor on today's podcast. Then when I come back, it'll be part two of myself and Andrew Kelly of Peachtree Hoops. Again, one more time, part one is available in your feed from yesterday. Part two is on the way. But first, a word from our sponsors on today's podcast. Today's show is brought to you by FanDuel. Football season is about to be kicking off, of course, and FanDuel is giving you a chance to win all season long because right now, when you win a Super Bowl winner, you can get bonus bets every single time they win in the regular season. Pick any team in the NFL to win the Super Bowl. You'll get bonus bets for each and every victory, and you can use, the, use those bonus bets on point spreads and player props, over-unders, and much more. The FanDuel app is safe and secure, and they have all kinds of betting angles across the sports world for you that cover the whole range of sports. That includes, of course, football, NFL, college football, etc., NBA, WNBA, college basketball, MLB, golf, tennis, soccer, auto racing, all that fun stuff, hockey when it comes. They have everything that you're looking for at FanDuel, and there's no better place in the entire world to bet on all of the football and basketball action than America's number one sports book. That is FanDuel, of course. So visit FanDuel.com slash locked on and start earning those bonus bets right now. That is FanDuel.com slash locked on. Check out FanDuel today. 
I'm going to get you out of here in a little bit, but I do want to get into two uh, more in-depth things. One of them we've teased a couple of times and that, and that is see Occam. I know it's kind of, there was a, there was a, there was a, there was a pause report. I thought it was interesting that it was not a talks are dead report. It was a talks are pause report. And I'm not saying that they're alive or anything like that, but I was going to ask you about that in general. So let's just start there real quick. Not that it has to be about Siakam as the only target, which I think people are, Hawks fans got very focused on Siakam and I, I get why, but um, having not talked to you in this form, uh, wh- what did you make of all of that? And also what did you make of the fact that they, uh, the Hawks reportedly, again, I did not report this, but Shams did, and he's usually pretty good at this stuff, uh, reported that they also offered AJ Griffin and that wasn't even enough for Toronto. Um, for me, I've, I've always been a Siakam fan. Like I've, I would say like relative to like the consensus that I see on him, like at least on Twitter, like I'm, I'm higher on that. I think he's one of the more versatile and adaptable, adaptable players in the league. Um, I've seen like a lot of questions about the fit, especially with DeJounte, just based around like the lack of shooting. But I really think he's one of the more complimentary players in the league. Like Siakam, despite being relatively higher usage for the Raptors, like his, his average time of possession is, is not that high. Like he's not a ball pounder. He's not somebody that will dribble the ball, waiting for a switch, you know, taking up the entire shot clock. Like he's pretty decisive. He's someone who can play off ball. You can use him as a screener and do cool things there. He's a good transition. He's a very good transition threat. Um, he's someone who can score in isolation in the post. Like there's there's just so many different ways he can create options for his teammates, whether through his own scoring or creating for them. Um, his adaptability, I, I think, is really his key trait. Like he's somebody that's kind of lacking a, a true standout elite level skill. But for me, it's it's really just his adaptability and versatility that stands out for him. I think he can really shine in a lot of different team contexts. And I really like him in Atlanta where he could be, you know, a second or third option and work off a tray. I think especially the way that he could unlock a Kongu for me would be really tempting long term. Um, so, you know, I've, I listened to the pod. I, I think <laughs> I'm definitely willing to give up more than probably you or Glenn or Westwood just based on what I've what heard there. But I'm still pretty restrictive in terms of what I would give up just because I want to see – I want to have more time to really evaluate their young guys, especially Griffin and Johnson. So I'm just not inclined to want to give them up. Um, you know, Zach Hood's made the point to us offline. I think it's true that teams always overrate their their young guys. Like it's yes. just, maybe Griffin doesn't make the step forwards that we think. But just when you look at him as far as historical categories have gone with rookie play – is he's been really impressive. So I, I just would want to see there more before I'm, I'm willing to deal him. Um, that's really the line for me I, is, you know, I, I've said from the beginning that I wouldn't include AJ Griffin in the deal, but at the same time, I, I don't think I would kill them if that's what they wanted, because yeah. once they acquired Murray, that once they acquired Murray and Snyder, that just represented a switch from the Schlenk era, you know, like they're not going to slowly develop guys. Um, tap the coach on the shoulder if they're not getting enough playing time. Like, they're really going to try to speed things up. Like, Snyder, I've tried to make this point, is much more of a veteran-friendly coach than I think people realize. Like, just because he has a very good offense and does, you know, have some impressive development cases doesn't mean that he's going to give players a long leash. And they're not going to do that like they did under Slink. Like, there's more possibility of younger guys not getting enough time that, you know, to develop. Um, if you look at guys that have been successful under Snyder, often it's been guys that have been pretty ready to play from the jump. Um, so them trying to speed the time on, I think, isn't surprising. But I do have limits on what I want to deal with uh, for Siakam. I don't think that deal is dead either. Like you said, uh, the, the pausing language, I think, is important. Um, so he is somebody that I'm interested in. Just I'm higher on consistency. I like how he could fit. But I still have some red lines that I'm just not willing to cross for, especially for a player that – you, you you have to get him to extend before you're really able to you know give up anything like too substantive. Yeah, I mean that's I was gonna say if you didn't, I mean I, I've got I, I think from mostly from Raptors fans that found the podcast uh, during all of this. I think you know I got framed as this like huge Hawks fan, which I think Hawks fans would probably laugh at. Um, and I think it is true what you said about how teams and teams do this, and especially fan bases do this. Like they overrate their own guys, and I'm cognizant of that always. And like I'm, you know, I try to push back gently on people. Like you know, some of the, I think some of the Jalen Johnson hype this summer has gotten a little bit out of control. And I, it, in a fun way, I'm not, I'm not trying to pour, you know, any water on anything. It's just one of those things where, like, I saw someone even today was like, I'll be, su- some, I think the framing was like that they'll be surprised if he's not like a fringe star by the end of the next season. It's like, well, so you don't like my uh, LeBron James comp, yeah, well, then. and that's one of those things. Like, obviously, I, I get it all, and I've been very, very consistent. Like Jalen has really high upside, but. 
it's important and like nuance is dead on this stuff and i totally get it the i'm never i'm not saying that siakam's not worth a lot because he is siakam's really good and i want to make that point again here it's like i'm not arguing that the hawks should lowball only for siakam that's not the whole that's not the reason i'm saying that and there's a reason I keep, I keep saying this, but it's it's the context of it all. If Siakam was under contract for three seasons or even two seasons, like you can give up a lot more for him, like the way the Hawks did for DeJounte. And Siakam's better than DeJounte, which he's proven a lot more than DeJounte has in the NBA. And like the Hawks traded a lot for DeJounte, but that, that was a deal that was much more understandable because it was it was a two year he had he had two years left and it was also cheap. The thing with Siakam is like a lot of this stuff is intel based and that you know a lot's been reported, but if you go on the reporting, which I, I would recommend taking it into account, if nothing else, that they don't really want to be traded, his side. And, you know, if that's the case, he's not willing to extend. Like, I'm sorry, you can't pay the same amount in a trade for that guy. If you are, especially if you're a Hawks team that, you know, we can debate on how good they would be, but there would be some question. Like, it's not like this, that, that's the final move that's putting you over the top to be a title a title winning team this year. Like, if you're the Suns, like, the you know, the Beal deal was like, obviously they are all the way in. The Hawks are not all the way in to where, like, I would probably argue if they, if they traded for Siakam, they wouldn't probably be a title team this year. I'm, I could be wrong about that. But, like, I think if you're going to do that deal with one year left on the contract, with no assurance at all, in fact, you have – almost anti-assurance that he's going to want to stay long-term, you know, you better be darn sure you're extremely good in that first season, because if you're not like, it's just, it's, it's a lot to trade. So I think it's been like framed as like, I don't like Siakam. I like Siakam. Siakam's really good. I think there are a little bit of basketball questions, mostly because of the, you know, you mentioned the shooting earlier. It's not that DeJounte and Siakam can't work together. It's that I worry about DeJounte, Siakam and a center, which is what you would do. And, for as much as Okongwu could might be able to shoot, we don't know that yeah. just yet. And Capella he makes has, way more sense for Okongwu than Kampala. He and he does. And look, there's a reason. That's one of the reasons. Not the only one. That's one of the reasons why a lot of the more credible intel that I was getting back in July, it was all like three team deals that involved Clint going somewhere else. I think the Hawks probably know that you don't want to have Murray, Siakam, and Capella on the on the floor together on a regular basis. Okongwu does make more sense, but even even with Okongwu. The theory that he might be able to be a shooter down the line, I, I believe it, but he's not a he's not like he's Brooke Lopez bombing from 28 feet right now. Like there are some limitations there. So anyway, we don't have to do the whole Siakam thing. I just feel like there's a little bit of nuance there. And as you as I always say to you offline, like uh nuance is dead. And it's it's because it is. And I, I almost wish it was an easier conversation. Like if Siakam had two years left and was just available in trade, it would be such a more straight ahead conversation. Like, cause and I, and if I'm the Hawks, yeah. I would, I would give up a lot more for him if he had two years or three years left. It's the one year plus his age, plus his like very, I mean, I'm not kidding, extremely targeted leaks from their side of things that say not only Atlanta, but anywhere. But I mean, I think Mark Stein at one point said like almost especially Atlanta, he doesn't want to come to, I'm not sure if that was a firm report, like it was more of a podcast thing, but still like there's, there's a lot of Intel to get over. And look, I'm the first to say if guys want to get paid, so if he gets traded to Atlanta, he's, he might end up staying, especially if the Hawks pay him. But bringing things again, full circle once more, if the Hawks have if, if the Hawks do that deal for Siakam and have a disappointing season, whatever that looks like, are they going to turn around and give him the $45 million a year contract and go well into the luxury tax? I, I don't know. Are they? Yeah, <laughs> and he has obvious financial incentive to stay in Toronto too yes. because he's eligible for the Supermax there. So if the season breaks the right way for him, then he makes substantially more money than he would otherwise. I've also heard that just on the family front, his, he's very settled in Canada. I mean, it's, it's, he's coming to a different country. I've heard that his family are Canadian citizens. So that's, you know, obviously a factor there too. But personally, my, my read the whole time is I think if he gets traded, he's going to sign an extension. And I know that that hasn't you know been the reporting at all. But I think there's just when you actually game theory out, like I, I think there's way too many unknowns to go to a completely different system where you're going to be lower in the hierarchy under trade than when you would be in Toronto, um, where you could have an injury. Like there's there's just too many questions for me personally to not take an extension. Like you you might have to give up a little bit more than what you want, but it it makes all the sense there to just take an extension so you can focus on the season and individual play and not have to think about, you know, what happens if I get hurt or something like that. So I think if they were to trade for him, he's going to sign an extension. And I know that hasn't been the talk at all, 
But I do think that's really a bit of a bluff on the agent side because he doesn't want to leave Toronto again due to the family and plus financial incentives he has. Um, but, and that really does change things too. If you knew that you were going to get him on extension, you could give up more. Like you said, I mean, yeah. then you could start to cash in some of your young guys a little bit more. And, you know, I, I agree with you that I don't think that team is good enough to win a title, but it could make a, you know, a deep playoff run. Like you could talk sure. yourself into a Trey Murray Siakam team going deep in the playoffs with Snyder. If things, you know, if they get the right side of the bracket, like they, they could make a deep run. Um, and the East right now is just not that compelling. I mean, we've already seen Chris Savage Porzingis has plantar fasciitis. Like, I don't think Boston got better. I mean, Philly's blowing up right now. Uh, uh, Milwaukee's age, you know, like it's, re it's really not that scary. I, mean, I do think that Dame's going to end up in Miami, but I, I really don't think it's a terrifying path. You know, so you could talk yourself if you're the Hawks into potentially making another deep playoff run. So I get the appeal there, but – yeah, there's just there's just a lot of factors to consider as far as what you're willing to give up. Uh, I think you and I are on the same page with all of all of that stuff. And uh, you know, again, like I think not that I I would I wouldn't want to trade AJ. I personally value AJ um, a little bit above Jalen right now, which I, I I don't mind anyone who feels the opposite. By the way, that's totally reasonable to me. Um, I would be trying to protect AJ. And look. I, I value a Kongwu over both of them at the moment, which is uh, maybe a hot take, but I don't know if that's true or not. No. How, how do you feel about that? As I say out loud, I think a Kongwu is the guy that I would choose to not trade <laughs> out of all those. I guys. like, yeah. I mean, just as far as what we know right now, like the knowns that that does make sense, but projecting down the line, I think just, man, it's so hard to get wing talent. Like yeah. for me, for me, it's, I, I would have Griffin the highest. I, I understand totally. I think it's more about, you know, being proven and all that. And yeah, I, I can't, man, uh, this is probably a different podcast, but I, I, I still think uh, a Kongwu, and we all understand why it's because of the role he's been in. I think he is wildly underrated nationally. Like I think he needs, yeah. to, I think he'll be a, he'll be a much bigger deal. And um, he could actually, have like a Bam esque, you know, outcome if things break right. Yeah, he can have, he, he was a top 10 pick for a reason. Oh, right. And so actually, while we're here, before we get out of here, I, I, uh, I was going to ask a follow-up earlier on something. You said the thing about, about Clint and the urgency, and this is um, something we talked about a lot. And in the fan base, I, I've seen, I still, it's, it's the middle of August right now. And I still have people telling me that Clint's quote unquote, definitely going to be traded. Uh, I, I, I firmly would not say that as someone who covers the team, because look in August, nothing is I mean, short of Dame Lillard being traded, which I think was probably going to happen and all that stuff. Like, Guys who are not on that level, if you're not traded by the middle of August, I am going to assume you're not you're, that you're not going to be traded. <laughs> like he still could be, but the fact that like people are just holding their breath like for a Capella trade any minute, uh, I don't think that's realistic. But let's just take a step back from that. Um, if you're the Hawks right now, I think well, number one, I think if you were going to move Clint, you would have done it already if you were going to. But um, what do you think about them potentially even, and I think maybe probably even running it into the season again, year four with both centers, because there are obvious pros and cons, but I feel like I asked this to everybody that I have on the podcast, but it's, it's really an endlessly interesting topic to me because of all of the sort of competing factors. Jake Fisher earlier in this off season, he, he made the point that the Hawks like the idea of having both Clint and a Conglu. I mean, obviously there's a lot to couch with that because they, you know, they want to drive up the market and so forth, but having two quality like starting caliber centers does make a lot of sense, especially when your team is guard driven it, it, having defense back there is particularly important. The way I, I generally approach things is if you're not a contender and there's a deal on the table that improves your long-term outlook with picks, I think, it, you know, it generally makes business sense to take that deal. So for me, you know, Dallas has been rumored a lot for Capello. I believe they definitely do want Capello. He would make them a lot better. Yes. If there's a deal where you could extract that 2027 20, first from them, you know, the pick, the Hawks again, don't have a pick that year due to them to do due to the Murray trade. So if you were able to get that pick in one of their army of, you know, good backup caliber, but not quite starter level centers, you know, like a JaVel McGee or even a Dwight Powell, who's not eligible to be traded until later, but still um, one of those guys. And I think they had the trade exception. So you, you don't really need to do too much else. Um, that for me would be a good enough deal to deal with Capella. But 
if, if, if you're not getting that first, if it's some other, you know, five seconds and something like that, like that's, that's not quite enough for me. And I know a lot of people are really eager to unleash the Kongwu and I'm, I'm, I'm very sympathetic towards that. Like I've been, yeah. a, I've been a Kongwu fan for a long time. Like I just said, it, he really does have something close to like a Bama out of bio ceiling. If things work out for him, um, the versatility that he gives you at the point of attack on defense, I think is really nice, especially his movement off ball. Um, so he is someone I'm really high on and I like how he could fit with Jalen Johnson. Um, but at the same time, like we just discussed, like this year is important for them, man. Like I, Capella has limitations in the playoffs. Just like guys that are play finishers have a harder time getting their offense. We've seen it with Capella. We've seen it with Jared Allen. We've seen it with Collins to an extent. It's just harder for them in the playoffs, but he can really help you get into position for a winnable playoff series in the regular season. So his yep. defense is just such a four raiser and having that 48 minutes of high level center play is a big advantage. So for me, like if you have a good deal on the table where you can get a future first and you're increasing your optionality for deals down the line, that makes sense. But if you're not getting a real draft asset in return, I value trying to win a playoff series a lot. So that's not a deal for me. Yeah. I mean, I would not, the way that I've said it, I, I think I'll say it again now. Like, I would not be looking to give Clint away. And it, like, the thing is, if the <laughs> – I'm laughing because of what I'm about to say. If if the internal uh, mandate, and they hate that word, but I'm using it anyway, was to not pay the tax, um, that probably meant you had, to, you had to give away or relatively give away one of your high-level salaries. But they already did that with Clint. Sorry, with, with Collins. You don't need to do it again with Clint because that, that just it just makes you worse. And it's the same thing as what we talked about earlier – I, I firmly believe the Hawks could have easily, very easily traded Clint if they wanted to take a middling return for him. They would have already done it. I, and I'm on your side. Like, I think they, they they were holding out for a real asset. I mean, this happened around the draft. It got reported. They asked for Josh Green from Dallas. And I think that they probably knew that wasn't going to happen. But that's what they were looking. They were not looking to just get get very little for Clint. They, they value him. Uh, Trey values Clint, which I'm sure is part of the deal. And look – it's competing because on one hand, I do think the next great Hawks team, great capital G great, will probably have a Kong Wu at center. But in the meantime, trading Clint for very little return makes you worse. And if you care about that, and I'm not saying you have to care about that. Like there's a school of thought that I was talking to somebody about, about, about this on Twitter today. Like if you're viewing this coming season as a more transitional season, and it's really about evaluating your young guys then sure, trade Clint and see what you have on a NECA. I don't mind that approach. And for me, I, I probably would have traded Clint already through the, kind of that lens because it's like such a weird asset calculation to not have traded him. But if you care about this season, um, and I know that you do from what you just said, and look, Clint's really good. I mean, I, I think that maybe a lot of the breakdown is that there's this belief out there that Akongu is like so much better than Capella. And it's like, okay, well, that's based on potential. And I'm not arguing that Capella has to be better than a Kongwu this season. We don't know. To this point, Capella has been better than a Kongwu. And Capella is a very, very, very good basketball player. You can debate on where, the, where, he, where he comes down, but trading him does not make you better. It, it makes a Kongwu have better numbers. It makes a Kongwu probably develop a little bit better, but it does not make you better on the court this season. So it's like a very, that's, that's, that's kind of what I was talking about when I set it up and asking you. It's there's so many different competing things because look, I want to see a Kong Wu play too. I was one of the few people at that draft that was like really pleased with that draft pick, even though it was kind of weird. Like it, it still remains weird now. It's so crazy, Andrew, you know, three plus years later that they might do this again. Like I thought Capella was going to be gone in two years max. And it might be four. <laughs> it's just such a weird situation, especially when uh, I know there's also this, this, this school of thought out there that a Kongu could play the four. They've never, ever, ever suggested that internally. And maybe Quinn's got a, some master plan that I've never heard about. That's definitely possible, but he's a center man. And they're still, they're just going to maybe do this again. And it's uh, I'm fascinated by it, honestly. Yeah, I, I'm with you the whole way. And it's just, for me, like you, you can still if you're not going to get like a real asset for him, then you can trade him as what he has one year left. He'll be an expiring next year. You can just trade him for a player that fits better. Yeah, you know, like or if or if it, like or at the deadline this year, like if you're not playing that well this year, if they're 500 at the deadline, I would totally understand 
okay, let's just cut the core on Clint, not pump the season, but like, okay, we kind of, we understand that we're not going to probably reach our huge goals this year. Let's see what we have in Kongwu. That might happen. I just think that like, right. you could, you could do it again next summer. Now, um, unfortunately, this is have, the last year. That, you'll, have, you'll, yeah. you'll have zero leverage ne- next summer because everyone in the world knows you're going to keep a Kongwu next summer. So it's like, the entire yeah, league is going to be like, hey, exactly. guys, we're not going to give you a cent for Capella a year from now, which might be where they are now, yeah. honestly. This is the last year. This is the last year you could probably go wire to wire with both those centers and it work out. Well, like next offseason, you have to deal with Clint. You can't have, well, it, or you, can, oh, you have to deal with Conway, Mike. And you it, can't really so have both, too. like after you pay at Conway. I must say it's not on my last uh, soliloquy. My apologies. But, um, there's also something I get I get asked about probably every day or two, and it's like, well, why can't Clint come off the bench? And it's like, well, I understand in, in the hierarchy, like you might want to talk about that, but guys as good as Clint Capella who are making 20 plus million dollars and are still playing like good starters don't come off the bench. And like, that's not what you're at center where like you, ha- you have to choose one of the two. Like it just doesn't happen. I know Tower said this too, and I disagree with him then, and I, I tell him that all the time. And I get it. Like, you want to see a Kongwu, but if if your plan was to bring Clint off the bench, you should have then you should have traded Clint. That that's what I would say. Like that's a trading is a much better option than bringing him off the bench. So if that's- he also, in my opinion, makes more sense when your forwards are Bay and Hunter than yes. uh, a Kongwu because that's and, that's really asking a lot of a Kongwu when you have forwards like that. Just well, both and, from a and, defense and, and rebounding perspective. Guards. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, you're, you're if, if you're going to start I mean, like. Yeah, if, if you're going to start like Jalen Johnson at the four or something, then I, you, you you can't go a Kongwu. But if it's going to be right. two forwards like that, it, it really is asking a lot of him in his first year. Capella just makes more that, sense as your traditional anchor there. Yeah, something I said to Josh Lynn on his show too, not to repeat myself too much, but like I, I – and he hadn't thought about this way, but it, it does make so much sense. And I, I don't – the Hawks – you know, this is pre-training camp, so maybe they have different plans, but I still project uh, a lot of Bay-Capella pairings and a lot of johnson Kongwu pairings just for many reasons. One of them is what you just said, the rebounding aspect, the rim protecting aspect, and also on offense, you can get away with Capella a little bit more if you're playing four shooters around him versus if you're right. playing, if you're Again. playing a, a Kongwu, uh, Johnson's lack of shooting doesn't really hurt you as much when you have a Kongwu's versatility on the court. And plus we saw those guys work together last year. It's just a natural, I'm not saying they're going to play every minute together because they're not, but Trey loves playing with Capella. That's well documented, both from him saying it and reporting around that. So you start Trey and Clint, and then you kind of mess around from there. And look, I do think there's going to be even more games this year than there have been in the past where Kongwu might close the game. And that's fine. Kong was really good. I just think that as far as like the politics of the NBA, as far as like asset management, you, you don't just suddenly bury your legit, le- legitimately good established $20 million a year center because you want to see the other guy play. It's just not what happens. <laughs> yeah. And it's just unfortunate too, because the Kongwu is obviously extension eligible. Yeah. And so you have a guy that you took number six overall and he's still like not a starter like it's just there's no way you're happy about that if you're him well, and, and, and maybe and maybe, maybe maybe they end up paying him this maybe that's the uh maybe the trade-off i'm not sure if this is going to happen but right. maybe in october you get in the room and say okay onyeka we're going to pay yeah, you exactly like a starter. exactly year, and that's a point year. that i've made too like we just stuck a portal sign for you know 20 million average annual value that's about the going rate for a good starting center now so for him you could you could offer like four for 80 and just say hey you know, handshake deal. He's not going to be in the team, you know, next summer. If you take this, they will pay you like a starter and then we'll make moves the following summer. So you are actually, and maybe he'll do that. And I, I think he's, re- I think he's going to close games too, like against higher level competition. He's just, he offers so much more versatility on the stretch. So th- they at least have some carrots they can offer. Yeah. I mean, this, this, if you're doing a sort of the, the graph projection um, at some point, and I think we've already sort of a little bit of seen it from Clint last couple of years, but at some point the, the lines are going to inter- intersect and you're going to have a Kongwu being better. I don't think we've gotten there yet, but it might be this year. Um, certainly would not surprise me at all because I think the Kongwu is on the rise. But uh, anyway, we can go all down this stuff, but I wanted to at least get that out there because you talked about it earlier. I forgot to ask you about it. Uh, you feel pretty good. I, I'm encouraged. Maybe Hawks fans are as well about you, uh, you know, kind of selecting the Hawks as your over team. And I, I can vouch for you, Andrew. You are good at the uh, find a team that you like more than the rest of the league. And you are your, your record on that the last few years has been very good. So that's probably a good sign for Hawks fans. Yeah, I, I think 47 to 48 wins. I mean, I could see how it could go under and I could see how it could even be slightly over that. But I just think that they have good continuity and the nine man rotation, it, 
provided they get the leaps from the younger guys in the mid rotation, I think is really promising. And we, as we discussed, I like the, uh, the friends depth too, and just much better coaching, positive regression from Trey efficiency wise, better fit with DeJounte after a year. I'm expecting them to be pretty good. I think we are on the same page. Uh, anything you'd like to plug before we get out of here? I know uh, you occasionally – uh, what's the word now on, on X? I, I always, I still say tweet cause I'm just, that's just what I'm going to say forever, but anything that people should be following you on the, on that machine. Or <laughs> somewhere else? I actually recently signed up for premium. So I got, I got the blue check now. Yeah. You, you, the blue check. you lost yours, man. Oh, I, I lost my check. That's true. hundred percent. I had to do it for the, uh, I had to do it for the DMS. I was getting limited too much, but people are already giving me grief for it, but yeah, nothing really to plug. I'm looking forward to football season starting. I'm a big, uh, college football, fantasy football guy. So, excited for this time of year absolutely and uh if you want to check out andrew's work on twitter slash x you can you can do that the link should be in my in in the podcast description all that stuff he does he tweets like once a week but it's always about the hawks generally speaking so there you go thank you andrew for doing this i might bug you again during training camp but uh, i appreciate you giving me some time here in mid-august pre-nfl and your fantasy onslaught as for everybody else please subscribe to this podcast anywhere you get your podcast tell a friend about the show and we'll see you all next time